held hostage to oil. It's more scary than you may think. Brought to you by Fueling Truth. Dirty Secrets Revealed. This brief documentary will outline the history of oil and its effects on the United States, the alternatives that exist today, why the public perceives alternatives as bad, why the alternatives are in fact actually good, and the dirty little secrets oil companies do not want you to know about gasoline blending. Petroleum became a major industry following the oil discovery at Oil Creek, Pennsylvania in 1859, following George Bissell and Edwin L. Drake when they made the first successful use of a drilling rig on a well drilled especially to produce oil at this site. This well is often referred to as the first commercial oil well in the United States. We found oil, and there was lots and lots of it. Life was good. So good, in fact, the global population skyrocketed to what is today over 7.2 billion people, which is up from just over 700 million before oil was drilled, refined, and utilized. We love oil. I mean, look at what it can all do for us. We as Americans can travel to New York City to see the sights or attend the big meeting. We can even fly to Barbados to relax and catch some rays. And we can do that once in a lifetime road trip with your dad or group of friends. All because oil takes us there. And we can transport more goods to more places all over the country by land, air, and water. Thus allowing dense populations in areas where food is not grown, work is not done, and resources for basic human survival is not originated. You might say, that's all great, so what's the point here? The point is this, to understand where we are getting a very large percentage of our oil from. Approximately five years ago, over 60% of our oil was coming from OPEC, or the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Many of these countries are not exactly what we would call friends of the United States, However, as we are so heavily reliant on their product, we involve ourselves in many of their conflicts. I am happy to say that today our imports from these countries is down significantly to only approximately 43% of all of our oil consumption here in the U.S. in an effort to have energy independence. But at what price do we pay? We are still fighting in the Middle East. We are still losing American lives in the never-ending conflict over protecting our oil supply and our oil supplying allies. And as for American energy independence, it looks to me like catastrophic, irreversible damage to our environment. Well, here is the overwhelming problem. Oil is a finite resource. It does not come spurting up from the ground anymore as if we are doing it a favor by releasing it. In fact, we are searching left and right, overturning every stone, trying to find more of it so we can go on living life as we have come to know it and support the population that exists today. We are drilling in dangerous places where the consequences of our oil dependence causes significant issues. And we are tearing apart what used to be a clean, beautiful area in North Dakota, Montana, and Canada in the Bakken Formation, removing the hard-to-get oil from tar sands. Sounds like a pretty dirty, scary future, wouldn't you say? But wait a minute. There are real alternatives. It is interesting, in fact, what good old American ingenuity has been able to develop. New forms of energy. There have been solar, wind, biodiesel, and by far the most controversial, and one might argue the most successful, ethanol. But why is ethanol so controversial? I mean, it looks like it does a lot less harm to the environment than oil, right? It uses something that is grown over and over and over again, year after year, right? So why is ethanol getting such a bad reputation? That answer is actually quite simple. 
the largest, most profitable industry in the entire world is scared of being minimized. The big oil companies have spent hundreds of millions of dollars funding large ad campaigns telling the U.S. public that ethanol creates high food prices and ethanol is starving children in third world countries because we are using food for fuel and ethanol is just flat out bad for your cars all of which are totally not supported and are in fact blatant lies that are spreading to protect their monopoly. It is actually quite interesting to note that prior to ethanol and the renewable fuel standard or RFS for short farmers could not produce their product and sell it at a price where they were able to provide themselves or their families with a living or to survive which caused the US government to pay tens of billions of dollars in farm deficiency payments to support farmers. Since enactment of this legislation in 2005 those payments for crop prices have dropped substantially and all but been eliminated. As it pertains to food prices, before ethanol came along, number two yellow dent corn, or field corn, commonly used in the ethanol production process, was provided to the livestock feed market, as well as a very small percentage, approximately two to three percent, to the human food market. As the market asked for more grain, more grain was available because it could be grown and produced at a profit to the farmers. So this still doesn't answer the question of why would you take grain and feed your cars instead of your people, right? To answer that question, you need to fully understand what is in a kernel of corn. The main components of corn is starch, protein, oil, and fiber. If you ask yourself, what does your body need out of that list, you would more likely say protein, oil, and fiber. Corn starch, on the other hand, is often referred to as a complex carbohydrate and in many cases even referred to as a resistant or pass-through starch, which does not provide that of any significant nutritional value to livestock or humans. Needless to say, globally we are starch rich and protein poor. In fact, all of the non-starch components of corn and ethanol production process is returned to the food and feed market, most commonly through a high-protein livestock feed called distiller's grain. As a general rule of thumb, because distiller's grain is such a high-protein product, it is generally one and a half times more valuable than the equivalent weight in a straight ton of field corn. To better understand, let's take a close look at your dollar you're spending in the grocery store. Important food items like bread, eggs, and milk have high prices that are largely unrelated to ethanol or corn prices, but correspond to fundamental supply and demand relationships in the world. The farm share of a food dollar is the share received by actual farmers from the sale of raw food commodities, of which a very small percentage, or only approximately three cents of each dollar, relates to corn. The marketing share includes other costs like labor, transportation, energy, or oil, and packaging which equates to almost 85 cents of every dollar spent. This makes sense. I mean ask anyone who has a garden, for example. They don't incur the costs even remotely close to raise their own vegetables as they would find in a supermarket because there's no transportation, labor costs, energy costs, or packaging costs. This entire misconception has played very nicely into the hands of big food companies as they are now able to blame ethanol on high food prices, whereas their corn or feed price had little to nothing to do with the final price. In fact, most food companies in 2013 are recording record profits as they rob you, the consumer, blind and blame the innocent ethanol. It is also important to note the largest cost in any food to market is transportation, packaging costs, both of which, you guessed it, depend on oil. So if the production of corn is up and the ethanol plant doesn't use any of the nutritional components of corn to make ethanol, what are the real concerns? Oh yes, that's right, all of those cars that are breaking down all over the road due to that ethanol stuff. For that being such a concern to everyone, it sure doesn't seem to be affecting those drivers that are running 15% ethanol blends in NASCAR. 
It didn't bother those drivers using 100% ethanol in the IndyCar series. And last and most practical, it doesn't affect the entire automobile fleet in Brazil running on a minimum of 25% ethanol blend. So why are we really so against ethanol today? Because ethanol has proven to be a very viable source of transportation fuel. You see, big oil companies are very, very greedy. The U.S. alone consumes approximately 130 billion gallons of gasoline a year. Ethanol production accounts for 10%, or 13 billion gallons. That is 13 billion gallons more than the oil companies really want it to be. You see, for every 1% more of the fuel market taken over by ethanol instead of fuel equates to about three and a half billion less revenue to oil companies. Perhaps that is why some prominent players in the oil industry have purchased ethanol refineries while others sit and wait for their slanderous ad campaigns and misinformation spread in lobbying efforts to crush the ethanol industry so they may purchase those distressed assets for a fraction of their cost. If the U.S. would follow Brazil's lead and begin using higher blends of ethanol, the U.S. consumers would save billions upon billions of dollars at the pump. Even if we just started by going from our current 10% blend to 15%, we would win. That would equate to 6.5 billion gallons. With the current dollar and 40 cent cost difference today, that would save the U.S. taxpayers collectively $9.1 billion at the pump. It all seems logical, and it is logical. But now it's time for the dirty little secret that the oil refiners would rather you not know about. Fuel quality. What is in your tank of gasoline? It is just gasoline and ethanol, right? Wrong. Absolutely not. In a typical gallon of gasoline that you can buy at any fuel station, you buy a formula consisting of many different components. Some that are okay, and others that are really, really bad. And the worst part of it is, most of these components are emitted at the highest level in inner cities during stop and go traffic, which just happens to be where the majority of people are. Scary, wouldn't you say? In fact, they are known carcinogens, and they're linked to respiratory disease, cancer, asthma, and even premature birth. In fact, what these oil companies did when ethanol first came on the market was flat out irresponsible as it pertains to public health and safety. You might assume that when they add ethanol into gasoline that it just cleaned up the fuel, right? Although that would normally be the case, in almost every instant it is not the case because the oil companies formulate the fuel differently when they add ethanol. What really happens is they do not even start with 87 octane gasoline or regular gasoline. They actually bring in a subgrade dirty fuel to blend with the ethanol. You might think, well, how do they get away with this? Easy. Ethanol is made 113 octane in its purest form which means oil companies can offload their junk fuel and carcinogenic components into the fuel supply and ethanol will help hide it for them. Why would they do such a thing, you might ask? Because it's extremely profitable for them to do so. Remember, they're greedy. Most every oil company is public, so you can check any corporate financial statements. These companies have been netting tens of billions of dollars annually. More so now than ever before because they are selling you baloney when you're paying for their filet mignon. So how can we fix this, you might ask? Simple, really. We could replace the bad components with clean components such as more ethanol. This would need to begin at the source, however, to ensure that the more ethanol that was added did not allow oil companies to dump more of their junk fuel into the formula. I hope you find the takeaways from this brief video disturbing enough to call you to action, to make a call, to write or email a member of Congress to express your concerns, and tell your friends and family. We are hooked on oil and it is becoming 
extremely hard to find and to extract. Our addiction is causing us to be involved in conflicts that should not concern us, risking many lives. There are other options other than oil and natural gas. You will hear criticism over alternatives to oil because it is attacking the most powerful, profitable industry in the world, and they aren't going to give up without a battle. Oil companies are also deliberately harming your health and the environment in exchange for an extra buck for themselves. 